How's the royal family? I pray that everyone is doing well. Well, my royal family, that's one of them videos you really need to go get. Yo, shit. But the drag, Campbell. Oh, yeah. Y'all knew I was not going to let this pass. I live in Campbell country, right up here in the Bay Area. Oh, Campbell, you ain't getting away with this shit at all. I'm going to refresh the royal family's memory. Now, my royal family, I know y'all was waiting for me. Y'all know how I go on my little hiatuses. This time I was actually sick. I thank you, Lisa. Lisa made sure I took the necessary supplements. Get myself together. I got a little slight, little slight bug. But I'm good now, my royal family. Y'all been seeing me around. And I've been absorbing all the hypervia. I've been absorbing all the bullshit. So we're going gonna, gonna to unpack it all. I'm going to make it sweet, like I always do. Lean all up in it. So, we are not surprised at all, my royal family, by Sleepy Joe's pick. It's like, pick your poison. It don't matter one way or the other. Both of their records is one and the same, slimy. Especially when it comes to making sure that black men continue to be incarcerated. We're going to see the sublimables and the sublimables are going to be reality of what this team going to continue to do to the royal family. She don't even mind locking up um, up here in California. She, she didn't even mind locking up. Children who, um, children's parents, especially their mamas, who um, the children didn't go to school in a timely fashion and did not, or missed a lot of school or did not find out what was the individual reason. And a lot of times um, these children were homeless, they didn't have proper clothing, or there was some issues on the home front. So she wanted to even threaten to even, unquote, lock up the black woman. Even though she would try to come off like a broad spectrum, she was always focusing on up here in California what she is willing to do to black folks. See, in order to be any type of politician, my royal family, um, especially the ones that look like you and I, they have to demonstrate that they have absolutely no power hanging their own out to dry. So there's a deeper message in this and I'll bring that last. All right, my real family, I got videos to show the royal family. I got two videos to show. One going to be long, you know, to refresh the royal family's memory. But after I go take out on this journey like I often do I'm gonna take you back to what they really saying so I didn't already gave you part of what Sleepy Joe and Campbell if they if he becomes the president but they really looking at her all right because you see Trump Trump is tripping and he like damn you know because you know Trump is unstable and all that and side note uh Trump's um brother is in ICU and they want him to rush to the hospital. Now, based on what I've been reading, they ain't said nothing, but it's, I smell Rona. I, you know, that's all I got to say. Anyway, as we continue on. Um, so keep in mind, ain't shit gonna change. But many of our folks, oh, been smiling north to south. And they've been especially pulling black women like they always do to try the Democratic Party been using black women for the longest to pull them over the hump. All right. So let's listen to this first video. All right.
Well, as Senator Kamala Harris rises in the early presidential polls, she's facing increased scrutiny over her record as a prosecutor in California. In 2004, Harris became district attorney of San Francisco. She held the post until 2011, whereupon she became the attorney general of California. We're joined now by uh, uh, Lara Bazelon, a professor at the University of San Francisco School of Law. In January, she wrote a widely read article in the New York Times titled, Kamala Harris was not a progressive prosecutor. Bazelon wrote, quote, time after time when progressives urged her to embrace criminal justice reforms as a district attorney and then the state's attorney general, Ms. Harris opposed them or stayed silent. Most troubling, Ms. Harris fought tooth and nail to uphold wrongful convictions that have been secured through official misconduct that included evidence tampering, false testimony, and the suppression of crucial information by prosecutors. Laura Bazelon joins us now from San Francisco. Thank you for joining us, Professor Bazelon. Um, can you start off by going through um, Senator Harris's record, starting with her being DA of San Francisco? Sure. So she was elected in 2004, and she took a pretty courageous stance initially in that she didn't seek the death penalty against a man who had been accused of murdering a police officer, and she did get a lot of blowback from that. Subsequently, she moved much more towards the center in many of her positions, and two things happened in her tenure as DA that I think are worth mentioning. One is that there was a big crime lab scandal whereby there was a lab technician who was using the drugs rather than testing them, and as a result, many, many convictions became tainted. And it turned out that her office had known for months, top attorneys had, and had not disclosed that information to the defense. And when a judge found out, she became quite incensed and wrote an opinion castigating Harris for allowing this to happen. Harris's reaction to that was to try to get the judge disqualified by saying that she had a conflict of interest because her husband was a defense lawyer. That failed, and 600 cases were thrown out. The second piece of her tenure that I think is important that not a lot of people know about is a case involving a man named Jamal Trulove. That case was tried by Linda Allen, who was one of Harris's deputies. And the case against Trulove turned against a single eyewitness, turned on one eyewitness. It was a one eyewitness identification case. He was convicted and sentenced to 50 years to life. And the Court of Appeals threw out that conviction, castigating what Allen had done as gross and egregious prosecutorial misconduct. They said, that her closing argument was a yarn made out of whole cloth. Recently, True Love sued the city of, Cal of California, excuse me, the city of San Francisco, and won a $13.1 million judgment. Now, you've also written about another case, George Gage. Could you talk about that as well? Yes, and this is what prompted me really to write this piece. It's Harris's record on wrongful convictions. So after True Love, there was Gage, and there was Johnny Baca, and Daniel Larson, and a man named Ho Jose Luis Diaz. And in these cases, what happened was that Harris was at that point the AG, the top official in the state of California, the top prosecutor. And when these convictions came up, they had been handled by lower DAs, and it was her job to decide whether or not to defend them. In George Gage's case, he had been convicted, again, based on a single witness. It was his stepdaughter, Marion, who accused her accused him of sexually abusing her, and the case turned on Marion's testimony. It turned out after the verdict that the prosecutor had suppressed a lot of material about Marion, including medical records and a note from her own mother saying, my daughter is a pathological liar who lives her lies. And rather than acknowledge that this really terrible thing had happened, that this prosecutor had held back information that might have swayed the verdict, what Harris's attorneys went into court and did was say, look, George Gage, who had been forced to act as his own lawyer, didn't raise his claim in exactly the right way, and so for this technical reason, you should affirm the conviction. It went to oral argument, and the judges were very concerned about that position, told the deputy to go back and talk to his supervisors to try to resolve the case, which was a signal to really get rid of it and do the right thing. And instead, Harris's office doubled down, and George Gage is uh, currently 80 years old, he is serving a effective death in prison sentence. I want to go to an interview uh, Kamala Harris did last month on Face the Nation with correspondent Ed O'Keefe. You take your prosecutorial record against the push in your party for criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of concern among, especially more liberal and younger mm -hmm. parts of the party. You may not be the best person to do that, given that you are implementing those tough on crime initiatives as a prosecutor. Can they trust you to do that? Well, here's the thing. When I became 
a prosecutor and when I was elected district attorney and also attorney general of California, I implemented some of the most significant reforms to date during those years that had been implemented. Like I said, I, I created one of the first reentry initiatives that became a model. It was designated as a model in the United States for what law enforcement should do to be, as I call it, smart on crime. I was the first in the nation leading the State Department of Justice in California, which by the way is the second largest department of justice in the United States, to require my agents to wear body cameras. I created, as Attorney General, the first in the nation implicit bias and procedural justice training for law enforcement, knowing that that had to be addressed, which is the implicit bias that exists in law enforcement and the potentially lethal outcomes that occur from that. So the concerns are overblown? The concerns are overblown, yes, no question. So that is Senator Kamala Harris on Face the Nation, speaking to correspondent Ed O'Keefe. Um, if you could respond to this, um, uh, Laura Bazelon. Sure. So you can hear her struggling to come up with a list. And she starts with her back on track program that she implemented as DA. This was a program that did help certain very select non-violent offenders re-enter society. It affected a very small group of people. She then talks about body-worn cameras. She was asked by the California State Legislature to support a bill to mandate all police officers wearing body-worn cameras, and she declined to do that. With respect to implicit bias training, that is important. What's also important, and I would say more important, is investigating officer-involved shootings. She was called upon by the legislature to do that, and once again, she declined. And then when you go down the list of the issues that we think about when we think about a progressive prosecutor, on every single one of those issues, she was on the wrong side. And in some cases, her opponents ran to her left. So for example, with marijuana legalization in her run for re-election as attorney general, her opponent ran to legalize. She was against it. She's since changed her position now that the vast majority of the Democratic Party has moved in that direction. There are other examples as well. Her failure to support legislation that would reduce certain felonies to misdemeanors, going after parents criminally for having truant children. So there's a lengthy list of policy positions where there was the progressive path and there was the center-right path, and she did not take the progressive path. Uh, I wanted to ask you specifically about this whole issue of, of parents with truant children and, and her pol uh, policy of trying to prosecute them. I want to go to Kam Kamala Harris's 2011 inaugural speech as California Attorney General as she touted her truancy policy during her tenure as District Attorney of San Francisco. This is what she said. We know chronic truancy leads to dropping out which dramatically increases the odds that a young person will either become a perpetrator or a victim of crime. Folks, it's time to get serious about the problem of chronic truancy in California. Last year alone, we had 600,000 truant students in our elementary schools which roughly matches the number of inmates in our state prison system. And is it a coincidence? Of course not. And as unacceptable as this problem is, I know we can fix it. In San Francisco, we threatened the parents of truants with prosecution and truancy dropped 32%. So we are putting parents on notice. If you fail to take responsibility for your kids, we are going to make sure that you face the full force and consequences of the law. So uh, that was Kamala Harris in 2011. What exactly did she do as DA uh, in prosecuting parents? So what ended up happening was that, and this actually took effect after she left and became attorney general, prosecutors then had the power under this law to prosecute parents for a misdemeanor for being essentially responsible for their children missing numerous days of school. The idea being that they would be scared into making sure that their kids actually did attend school and some parents were in fact prosecuted. And the pushback about this, I think, was on two fronts. One, it disproportionately impacted communities of color and parents of color who were basically more often targeted by this law than people who were white. And two, this idea that removing a parent from the home or subjecting them to criminal prosecution would be a tool to really sort of re-knit a family, which I think is, is very questionable. There are a lot of things going on when there are truant children, including poverty, drug use, 
different issues with kids, and it's just not clear to many people who work in the juvenile space that the right answer to that is to criminalize the parents' conduct. Mm. And has she responded since? I mean, that was a clip in 2011. Now that she is running for president and her record is being questioned on a number of these issues, well, I mean, that to me has been what's been frustrating, is that I don't find her responses to be responsive to the questions that she's being asked, and I don't feel oftentimes that she's being asked the hard questions. So the Face the Nation clip is kind of the perfect example where she's thrown what I think is sort of a softball and then responds by ticking off a couple of accomplishments that when you look at them in the bigger context actually aren't that progressive. And so part of it is that she hasn't been pushed directly to answer for truancy for George Gage, for Jamal Trulove, for marijuana, for opposing testing in Kevin Cooper's case. I mean, she's not getting those questions, I think, directly and forcefully enough. But then also, disappointingly, I think she hasn't reckoned with it and said, look, I am responsible for those decisions. She has said more broadly, the buck stops with me, I was the head of my office. But she needs to take that next step and acknowledge these specific things that she did and reckon with that record. I want to go to Senator Kamala Harris speaking to reporters in January as she announced her candidacy for president. Senator Harris was asked about her role in defending the California Department of Corrections efforts to prevent transgender prisoners from getting gender reassignment surgery. I was, as you, as you are rightly pointing out, the Attorney General of California for two terms, and I had a host of clients that I was uh, obligated to defend and represent, and um, I couldn't fire my clients. And there were, unfortunately, situations that um, occurred where my clients took positions that were contrary to my beliefs. And, um, and there, it was an office of a lot of people who um, would do the work on a daily basis. And do I wish that sometimes they would have personally consulted me before they wrote the things that they wrote? Yes, I do. But the bottom line is the buck stops with me. And I take full responsibility for what my office did. But on that issue, I will tell you, I vehemently disagree and, in fact, worked behind the scenes to ensure that the, the Department of Corrections would um, allow transitioning inmates to receive the medical attention that they required, they needed, and deserved. So that was Senator Harris when she was announcing for president. She was speaking at Howard University. Professor Laura Bazelon, your response? Well, I think what is important to do is to back up and talk about what the job of a prosecutor is. So many people think that it is about convicting people, and it is not. It's actually about doing justice, and that means that if you see something that is wrong, not just against your core principles, but violates, for example, the Equal Protection Clause or the Due Process Clause, you are required as the top prosecutor in your state to stand up and say, I won't enforce this law. And in fact, that's what she did in Proposition 8. So to say, I had these clients and I had no choice but to take these positions is not correct. So I'll give you this example. Proposition 8 was passed by California voters banning same-sex marriage. When she was basically told that she needed to defend this law, she refused to defend it because it violates the Equal Protection Law, in her opinion, and actually as the Supreme Court later decided. So she had that option when it came to this transgender surgery. She had that option when it came to the death penalty. When that came up and a judge found that it was unconstitutional, she defended it. And her response has always been, well, these are my clients. But in fact, no, your job is to uphold hold the Constitution, and if you think these laws violate the Constitution, then you should not defend them. Uh, I want to ask you, in your op-ed piece, you, you say that the term progressive prosecutor has become a trendy uh, subject these days. What do you see as what marks, uh, would be some of the hallmarks of a truly progressive prosecutor uh, in America in 2019? So you're right, it has become this real buzzword, and we just saw last week with this insurgent campaign of Tiffany Caban in Queens. This is someone who's 31, a queer Latina, a lifelong public defender, never prosecuted a case, and she ran on a platform of dismantling our system of mass incarceration, decriminalizing certain crimes, not prosecuting certain crimes, ending cash money bail, which is essentially a criminalization of poverty because it says to people whether you can get out or not doesn't really depend on anything other than your ability to pay, which means a wealthy person can be free and a poor person has to stay and languish in jail while their case goes forward. So progressive prosecutors, they run on those platforms and they also run 
most importantly to me, on a platform of we are going to correct wrongful convictions and when people are suffering and dying in prison and they are innocent or they are wrongfully convicted because of corrupt official misconduct, we are going to uncover that, we are going to go to court and we are going to do the right thing and undo those convictions. So it's a laundry list of policy positions and they are brave and they are new in our system because we've had for so many decades people running on who can be the toughest on crime. But a lot of Americans are getting really fed up with that because it's expensive, it's ineffective, and it's unjust and, and racist. And so these new prosecutors are embracing reform and they are running and they are winning on that platform. Laura Bazelon, we want to thank you for being with us, professor at University well, of San Francisco School of Law, director of the school's criminal and juvenile justice. Well, my royal family, y'all got a sample of what's going on in California. And when I say Campbell country, Campbell is right up here in the Bay Area. So we have had first hand of Campbell's, um, um, war on the royal family and prosecuting them and also um, she has she has demonstrated that when I was in my in, uh, introduction she has demonstrated that she is committed a thousand percent to continue to incarcerate black men at all costs. And um, she has even mentioned if they let too many um, prisoners out, then they don't get that free labor. That came out of the horse's mouth, and I should have put that video up, but it's too late. Take my word for it on that one, my royal family, because I'm in Campbell country. And so... Um, there's some other things that Campbell is known for. Now, let's blow this up a little taste. So I make sure y'all don't lose sight. All right. So, basically, Campbell openly had an affair with Willie Brown. Openly. He's a married man. So, you, you know, Campbell is straight, greasy, side piece, thought, whatever that means. You know, whatever that means to y'all. Whatever name you want to, whatever spin you want to put on it and stuff openly. And just to, you know, make it real juicy. She had two positions that he had gave her to work in California. Where I think in each position, you could make about around about a hundred thousand so she's making around about two hundred thousand and working these two departments but nobody would never see her at work so she basically fucked and sucked her way to the top it is what it is y'all know when y'all come over here i'm not quite filtered i gotta keep it raw sometimes so you know it, it's subject to be some some Carpet burns on girlfriend's knees, elbows, and back. All right? You know, she might have even had to get a, a, a new, you know, weave and all of that. Because maybe homeboy knocked it out. You know, it is what it is, my royal family. So, you know, I thought I would add that in. Now, since she has elevated, she don't know Willie Brown no more. She act like when he show up, she don't see him because, you know, she got a new flavor. So now she's playing like she ain't married to this dude. A lot of people don't know this. This is like, you know, she don't put that out forth. I don't know what her thing is, but we know Campbell Lee right up here. I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to make sure that, you know, the royal family know what's really going on. And I'm obligated, Campbell, because, you know, I'm right here. We close, kind of close to the same age. I ain't lost sight. And, you know, I ain't not going to older man. But at that time, you was like somewhere up in your 20s messing with this man. And he's still married. So Campbell so far has demonstrated 
how greasy she get down. And I have often said, when you see black folks in higher and higher, with the what the enemy deem as higher positions, they have demonstrated. Again, they have demonstrated what they will do to us a thousand percent. They are definitely compromised. And Kamala and Biden is one and the same. Because we know how he feel about us. You know, he don't, he don't want no predators around his children. So, what's the big difference? Trump need to keep doing what he doing. He tearing this shit down real good. And so, they trying to trigger us. No, there's a signal going on. Well, I'm going to bring it all together, my royal family. But I'm going to milk it for all it's worth. Ain't it juicy, my royal family? Don't true royal get down? I've been gone for a couple of days. You know, when I come back, I'm going to bring the gauntlet. Real juicy-like. So anyway, let's hear what, you know, Kamala got to say about certain things. Do you support reparations for black people? Well, listen, again, we had over 200 years of slavery. We had Jim Crow for almost a, a, a century. We had legalized discrimination, segregation, and now we have it, it, le segregation and discrimination that is not legal but still exists and is a barrier to progress. We have disparities around housing. We have disparities around education. We have disparities around income. And we have to recognize that everybody did not start out on an equal footing in this country. And in particular, black people have not. And so we have got to recognize that and do something about that and give folks a lift up. That's why, for example, I'm proposing the LIFT Act. Give people who are making $100,000 or less as a family a tax credit, which will benefit and uplift 60% of black families who are in poverty. So by default, it affects black families, but there's not a particular policy for African Americans that you would explore. But no, if you look at the, it, the reality of who will benefit from certain policies, when you take into account that they're not starting at, at, at the same place and they're not, stand, they're not starting on equal footing, it will directly benefit black children, black families, black homeowners, because the disparities are so significant. So if we focus on the specific issues that have resulted in the greatest disparities, and we understand that that's part of why we're doing it. Listen, the, the reality also is this. Any policy that will benefit black people will benefit all of society. Let's be clear about that. Let's really be clear about that. So I'm not gonna sit here and say, I'm gonna do something that's only gonna benefit black people. No, because whatever benefits that black family will benefit that community and society as a whole and the country, right? All right. So Kamala was very clear on her position. She said, hell no. She said, hell to the no. I'm not just going to look out for black folks. I got to continue to pander to the enemy. See, there's something I've been saying for the longest, my royal family, that, um, that, um, just the thought of us standing alone receiving anything fucks them up all of them the enemy and the enemy supporters just the thought of it they always want us to be inclusive so she's not for reparations at all what she is for is what I just show the royal family that long video making sure 
to uphold white supremacy a thousand percent. Ain't not a damn thing going to change. Me personally, and I could be real wild, I think Trump going to be the president again. Now, he wearing himself to death and coming up with all this crazy shit. I could be wrong. But the much deeper message that I want to get into is, you know, the other night I'm looking at all these black folks buck dancing and smiling north to south about Campbell. And um, really what some of these folks were saying is, or most of them, let's dismiss all her record up here in California, how she messed over black folks. Let's dismiss all of that. Let's dismiss what we just had, what she just said. Oh, I ain't gonna just do nothing for um, just black folks. I'm gonna do something for everybody. And they own don't have a problem doing something for their own, and I have no problem with it. What they are really saying, my royal family, is that having Kimberla Harris elected as um, vice president, and then they looking at her as president, because Sleepy Joe don't, I don't know, he got wobbly on his feet, that she could possibly become president, that she would be our reparations. And we should just be overjoyed that she's up there upholding white supremacy. I'm telling you, my royal family, that's just how true royal look at stuff. Uh, you know, I, am I tripping? Yeah, I stand to be corrected. It's like, let's dismiss all that and let's just be utterly happy that she just up there. And we gonna forget about all of this. And this is who she laying with at night. You know? So how you get from this to that and burns and all that and, you know, ooh we. This bitch is dangerous and shrewd. She worse than Sleepy Joe. Because anytime you're going to demonstrate something to the enemy, you're going to go above and beyond. I'm spitting flames. I don't trust her ass at all. Lisa Cabrera said something to me really interesting the other day when I was talking about this behind the scenes. And, you know, I often look at things spiritually. And I said, but looking at the word, you know, how these prophecies go, and we're watching Babylon tear down, we didn't see no woman in there holding a leadership position. And Lisa came up with something quite brilliant. And I may not be saying the words verbatim, Lisa, but it was along the line of she's a representation. She is mirroring, mirroring Esau. That if you didn't see that this is a black woman and just looked at everything on paper, you would think she was a white male that was doing all this, just the prosecutor. So I said, wow, never thought of it like that. So it ain't always as clear, but it's clear what they demonstrate and what they represent in their actions. So it, they're the figurehead. So it, that doesn't necessarily have to be in a particular package. As long as they uphold white supremacy. As long as they keep tyranny on the royal family. And keep this ball rolling. They don't want nothing. You know, you don't be shaking up nothing. You know, we got to keep this thing flowing. So I said, okay, that, yeah, I, I can see that. I can see it like that. That helps. That's why it's real important for the royal family to render their voice. Because we we chosen. And I can't do this alone. Sure. I need my father and I need the royal family. But I said, I must, I must present this to 
the best of my ability. So again, keep this on your frontal lobe as they push this agenda in these next few short months that they're going to build her up as this is your reparations and this going to be the answer to get the royal family out of all their pain and plight and you cannot put your energy and your being in this system Look at it spiritually, listen to it spiritually, and follow Yahweh and Yahweh only. Because when you get caught up in man shit, they'll fail you. And they have failed us over and over and over again. They cannot make us richer than nations. But that does not mean to give up the spirit of a d o s we must keep pushing that agenda to keep them uncomfortable because they really want us to shut the hell up oh no it don't work like that so we supposed to just dismiss everything, all the atrocious things that y'all are doing to us every millisecond as I speak. So, Campbell, you ain't fooling us at all. Sleepy Joe, you ain't fooling us at all. So far as I'm concerned, they can leave the piece of shit that they got up there doing what he doing. Like Farrakhan said, this joke could be president, he gonna take this country into abyss. And Trump is doing an excellent job. So this is what I need the royal family to do. Render your voice with your beautiful divine words. And it's always my royal family. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your support. And with that said, Ashay.